welcome back to another week of Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Lynn Elias, MovieSharkDeBlur.com, and Greg Srizavosti is back with me. Greg Srizavosti, DeepestDream.com. Yes. I should start mentioning deepest, that. Deepest Dream. Deepest Dream. So I don't have to keep doing it. Not as good as MovieSharkDeBlur.com, though. But I, 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 hey. Getting up there. Trying. I'm loving, <laughs> I am loving DeepestDream.com and what you're doing with with your sound bites and things oh, from you. different junkets and interviews that yeah. you do because I, I can't do long form reviews like you because it's just too uh, it takes forever <laughs> let me tell you it takes forever <laughs> but it's good i love i love reading them yeah. but i'm stealing some some of the ideas that you give me for taking just little sound bites right, right. so i'm i did my i broke something out last night on mm. my site on Simeon rice okay right and just have a couple like what the impetus that sent him into filmmaking and then what he is learned now. Oh, that's great. It's like a yeah. beginning and an end point. So it's just two little three minute clips. Right. Oh, that's so awesome. So I'll yeah. see how. Okay. Because, you know, I like that on yours. So I'll try it out. We'll see how it works. Yeah. C a combination of brevity and long form is always good. Yeah. So. And I'll still keep, and I, obviously, I'll keep doing all the, all the long form stuff. But yeah. just to get quick little sound bites out there for the audience. Yes, I think is important. But this isn't a quick little f show. This is a this, no. This is an hour long show, and when you watch right. this week, you're going to be bedazzled and bejeweled. Did you notice the new visual aids this week? Uh, yes, those are rings. I see right now, the, which I'll probably never buy for anybody, but those look nice. What, what, I think those are rings. Are they rings well, or are they? You the can't ear? buy them. I can't. I brought all of this. This is These part are... of my personal collection because oh. there is a new book that is out. I'm going to disrupt the display okay, in Jordan's perfect it. camera okay, camera work. Yes. Creating glamorous jewelry with Swarovski elements. Mm. Swarovski has been part of Hollywood going back to the third, 20s and 30s. Mm. Oh, you can touch it. You can touch it. Um, yeah. And Cinderella, it, right? You did that? At Cinderella. Yeah. Cinderella was a big one. And with yeah. Ro the most recent Romeo and Juliet, they actually started a Swarovski entertainment division where they now partner up and they become producing partners of films as opposed to just creating mm. uh, beautiful jewelry, making glass, designing glass slippers and providing tens, hundreds and thousands of crystals for jewelry and for costumes. But what's beautiful about this book right. is it takes some of the most exquisite pieces of jewelry worn in Hollywood, and it actually, for people that are jewelry makers, that gives you the diagramming and the steps for how to make how to make these pieces. Oh, interesting. You know, yeah. if you go find the stones, be it Swarovski or be it you know some other type of cabochon or real gemstones. So. In honor of Swarovski, I brought in one of my prized pieces, which is a Heidi Douse piece made with oh. Swarovski crystals. Oh, nice. It's all Swarovski and, uh, and with, peppered with some genuine gemstones, cabochon gemstones in there. Oh, nice, nice. And then the. How long have you had that? Uh, probably t close to 20 years. Okay. Yeah. Then I also brought in from. Hollywood collectibles, um, and I don't even know if they're around anymore. Originally, I think Penny Marshall was one of the founders of the company, mm. which doesn't surprise me because her best friend is Carrie Fisher, and Carrie Fisher is Debbie Reynolds' daughter, right. one of okay. the greatest collectors yeah. of Hollywood right. history ever. Yeah. And what the company did was they would take classic pieces of jewelry and duplicate them now, one-of-a-kind pieces that had been made for film, and duplicate them now with real gemstones, so I actually have here replicas of a ruby ring worn in Public Enemy. <laughs> uh, Betty Davis's Iolite ring from Little Foxes. Nice. A, uh, an exact duplicate of earrings worn by Ava Gardner. Nice. In a film or just worn by her no, out on the town? Those were worn in a film and out on the town. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the other one is a Greta Garbo piece. <laughs> and these are, all, wow. these are all real gemstones, yeah. though. They're not... They're not Swarovski, but okay. it shows the impact of Hollywood into the jewelry market. And, you know, we see this with the costuming now with little princess costumes, but mm. now big princess costumes, right. too. But jewelry is such an integral part of Hollywood. And I'm hoping that later on in the fall during award season, we'll get to do something with a special guest on Hollywood jewelry. Okay, I, I don't want to spoil that spoiler, so I I even don't know what that is, but so, I I'll be surprised myself. But, yeah, if people want to see great. really beautiful stuff. Watch our show today on the on the video cast. Nice, <laughs> nice. 
Well, I was reading the back of the book. It said Grace Kelly, Mae West, Sophia Loren, Dorothy Dandridge. All pieces that they wore. Liz Taylor. Are in this book. Oh, amazing. With, yeah. 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 Now, but for today's show, Mm -hmm. we have a very fun show, I think, and a very eclectic show. And, And laborious. It's not lo- it's lo- I mean, it's, yes, uh, it is laborious. I mean in a good way. Okay. Yeah, sorry. He is, I'm he horrible is, with the puns. He is celebrating Labor Day the yes. Ed Elias way. Yes. You know, because in the Elias household, Labor Day, you labor. Okay. Okay. And even though Tubby is gone, mm. Debbie still labors on yes. Labor Day. There's still work to be done. There is work to be done. But it's fun work today. Today is a lot of fun. Anytime I'm with you is a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't yeah, know about versa. being. I don't know about being uh, with those Brian guys and Jordan, are, yeah. you know, yeah. who aren't paying attention. Yes, so we can say what we want about. They're doing their them. guy talk. They're doing their guy talk. Yeah. So. But we. No, we're talking about. I don't know if you mentioned it on air. You probably didn't because I've been listening to the show, so I know you haven't. But we got new carpet. Well, yes, yes, the studio did get new carpet. You know, maybe we'll have Jordan take a screenshot afterwards and insert it into the video so that you can all <laughs> okay, see the good. new carpet. Very good. It's actually very nice carpet. But the best part is that they cleaned up my engineer room. So there's no cables running around randomly. It's so beautiful in here, so we're admiring it. It is very clean, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm willing to take bets on how long it stays that way. Yes. It'll oh. be. <laughs> it's already a mess from like three days in. <laughs> well. Nice. <laughs> today, we have some very special live guests okay. starting at 11.15, uh, a young man who I adore. Mm. He is, and I mean this sincerely, the coolest guy around. He is fashion forward and fabulous. Joshua Rush, one of the stars of Breakpoint. Scene stealer. Scene stealer extraordinaire. Yeah. I mean, he puts Jeremy Sisto, David Walton, J.K. Simmons to shame. And they're all good in the film, by the way. They're all, f- you've seen yeah. it. Yes, I've seen it. I've seen I it. love Breakpoint. Everybody knows I love Breakpoint. And I, I have to thank, you know, Rebecca and Margaret over at PMK. Okay, yeah. For hooking me up originally with all of these guys for some spectacular interviews. And uh, then for Joshua's own marvelous publicist, Nilda, who worked with me to get Joshua on the show today. And just a quick recap on what Breakpoint is about. It's a Breakpoint, th- we've got yeah. two brothers that do not speak. Ah, oh, I can relate. <laughs> um, and they haven't for years. They used to be junior doubles tennis champions. They could have gone on to the Open, to the World uh, stage. They didn't. The Jeremy Sisto character, who is much much like a John McEnroe bad boy of tennis. He's very colorful. He's and very colorful and very... Opinionated. Yes, a lot like me. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but he go, you know... A bit he, rude sometimes, too. Too? Yeah. And... He tells his brother, forget it, I'm going with somebody else as, as a doubles partner. And he does. Well, now in his, you know, years later, in his 30s, it's like this is his last shot if he is ever going to get to reach that championship status. Yeah. The only thing is he's burnt out every doubles partner out there. And the only person left for him to go to to possibly help him is his brother. Right. So this is about reconnection and repairing relationships and then we have Joshua in the and J.K. Simmons plays their father, yeah. a very sage, wise veterinarian, and <laughs> Joshua plays Barry, a young outsider who is a student of David Walton's character Darren, because after he left tennis, he went into teaching. Yeah. And but, you know, Barry has no friends, and he kind of gloms on to Darren as summer vacation. Uh, uh, takes place and he's very precocious he's very precocious and uh, he is he's you know as director jay karras you're going to hear jay say here in a minute in a sound clip Mm -hmm. he's like an an 80 year old and a 12 year old body (laughs) um but joshua is he's very dear to me he is a local culver cityite i did not know that yes yes points for that and wow, uh, awesome. he and he and I both love the rides at the La Bayona Festival. So I'm going to see if he made it this year to okay. the festival that took place last week. Very quickly on the film, one of the biggest things about Breakpoint that I love the most is uh, it takes you on a certain journey, but there are very unexpected moments that kind oh, of creep up. Very much so. It could have gone the very predictable route of a kind of coming of age comedy brother. And it doesn't. Kind. It doesn't go that way. So in a good fashion. Because so. we don't just see. Barry coming of age, we see Jeremy Sisto's Jimmy coming of age. Right, 
Right, and it has its really fun, great over-the-top moments, but I think a lot of the comedy comes from really real situations yeah. that, that people can you know really relate to. So I, I enjoyed the film. Oh, yeah, and I, I love it. So before okay. we get Joshua on the phone, I want you all to hear, I sat down with, I talked to Jay Harris, mm. and director of the film, and Jay has now made the leap from television to film with Breakpoint. It's a film that... He told me he just absolutely had to, had to do. But as we both agreed, the linchpin here is you had to find the right actor for the role of Barry. Because truly, the heart of this film rises and falls on Barry. So, here's what Jay had to say about finding our little star. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest concerns <laughs> of mine and shared by the producers was how are we going to find Barry? Uh, we knew that the movie lived and died with whoever that, that kid was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we talked about maybe we use a non-actor and really cast the net wide. And then I realized, you know, I, I think I need an actor kid because we don't have time. Like, I don't have time to work on getting a good performance. Like, I need an actor who can deliver take after take after take in the short period of time we have. And our casting directors brought in tons of kids, and she would email links out. And I remember that night I was, you know, slogging through just link after link of kids that weren't, you know, whether they were good or not wasn't, wasn't the point. It was like, they just weren't right. And I all of a sudden pulled up Joshua's uh, audition, and before I even pressed play, he had, uh, like, skinny pants pulled up high with a belt on and a super bacon T-shirt tucked in. And he just had this physicality. I said, oh, my God, I wonder if this is it. And I pressed play. And I was like, oh, my God, this is Barry. And I called my wife into the room, and, and she hadn't been following the saga at all. I hadn't been showing her stuff, but she knew about my, you know, uh, trepidations about finding the right Barry. And I played it for her. She goes, oh, my God, that's Barry. Like, and then the next day we all uh, reconvened, and all the producers uh, shared the same thought. We brought him in for a callback, and um, he, we just talked to him for a little bit, and then we hired him there on the spot that day in the room. He was amazing. Yeah, no, he's a talented little kid. I keep telling people he's an 80-year-old actor in the body of a 12-year-old. And I, I think mm. that's a very fair assessment by Jay, you know, of Joshua. And for those that aren't familiar with Joshua from his appearances in Parental Guidance, he played a young Abe Lincoln uh, or a young uh, Thad Lincoln in Saving Lincoln. Uh, he's done voicing galore, Family Guy, the new uh, animated show, The Adventures of Puss in Boots, another one called Clarence. I think he's just absolutely astounding yeah. astounding and in parental guidance he is hysterical you know he and bailey madison going toe oh, to toe okay. against billy crystal and bet midler oh nice they hold their own they oh trust me okay. trust me and the kids learned a lot from those comedy veterans i think it's safe to say but you know how do you know because uh, you know with barry it's not just getting the right actor for that part but he's got to gel with Jeremy Sisto and mm. David Walton, right? which is already going to be tough because David, as a lot of people may not know, he is a nationally ranked tennis player. Oh, I did not he know He has that. a five out of, uh, I think it's a five out of seven um, NTSA rating okay. or ranking. Okay. Yeah. I know he's been playing since he was three. Yeah. That, that I know that. Yeah. So that in and of itself is amazing. But so what do you do? How do you know if, if your perfect Barry is going to be perfect with the other guys? When he came into the room, um, you know, Jeremy was in there uh, with me and uh, the other producers and we all, and Gene, and we, we just knew he was our Barry. We just knew it would work. And, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, the first day on set, it was, um, it was a pretty quick fit, you know. There, there wasn't that much massaging that needed to happen. Like he, you know, I talked to Joshua a lot beforehand, and he just kind of got it, you know. Mm -hmm. So we definitely did a lot of, um, you know, we did a lot of adjustments on how to deliver things, and just, but really just for options. It's not like it was what I was saying before. Like I didn't have to work with him to get one good take. It was like, hey, let's just get a bunch of different, different varieties so that I have options when I'm editing on how to play this scene. And right now, we have the man of the hour himself, Joshua Rush. Hello, Joshua. Hello. Are you there? Oh, we seem to be having some phone difficulties. Mm. So we're going to take a quick break and see if we can get Josh back on the line. 
and we'll be right back. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And hopefully I have my friend Joshua on the phone. Are you there, Joshua? Hi. Hello, Josh. It's Debbie. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. And my friend Greg is here with me as well. Hi there. Hi. I I can't tell you how excited I am to have my buddy here on the show today. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. Oh, my gosh. The big question I have to ask you is, did you make it over to the Fiesta La Bayona to the rides last week? I didn't. I didn't get to go. <sighs> I I got sick and uh, you know. I didn't get. Uh, to, I didn't get to go either. I I went last year and uh, it was on the day before my school started and it was so much fun. And I went and with all my friends and we all went on all the rides. It's so much fun. No, oh, but I I was so bummed that I didn't get to go. Oh, and this year they even had a, 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 the farmer's market there, too, in addition to all the rides. Really? Yes. <laughs> I know, and I'm as bad. I really wish I had gone. I know. So I wish I had gone, too. I was off doing interviews, and I missed it. Wow. So, you know, these people, they just don't. Next year. Next year we can go together. <laughs> Next year we will go together, and we will ride all the rides together, and we'll do a special for the Culver City Observer of our take on the festival. Perfect. Let's do it. It's, it's a date. <laughs> so, my friend, this is an amazing. Greg and I were talking about it at the top of the show. Greg loves your performance in Breakpoint. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's a it's a really fun movie, and it was it was a lot of fun. Well, and before you called, I played a clip of my interview with your director, Jake Harris, who just raved about finding you and went through the story of how he did find you and how thrilled he was to have you play Barry. That was, you know, the process, that casting process was really weird. It was, it's definitely the strangest casting process I've ever gone through, but it was He's he's a great guy, and everyone on that set really was just amazing. Well, and I know how much Jeremy and David love you. They they're I love them too. They're as I said, everyone's amazing. So, I've been really lucky in my career to meet meet and work with such incredible, talented, and kind people too. So what is it? What is it about Breakpoint that you really like? Because you, re- and I've said it before, and I will keep saying it, you steal the show from all these veterans, from J.K., from Jeremy, from David. Once you are on that screen, all eyes focus on you. What is it about, what is it about, I know, if you were here, you'd be blushing, I know. I am blushing. Oh. <laughs> what is it about Breakpoint that you love? I love Barry. Barry is weird. He's, I think we all just have, we have Barry in us. He's, he's weird. He's funky. He wears outrageous clothing. And I think we all have that little part of us that always gets caught in the filter. And I think we all kind of repress that part of us. And so Barry was really exciting to me because I got to let it out. And in the first place, I have less of a filter than most. So there was already some of that there. But with Barry, I got to really let down the floodgates, and it was awesome. Joshua, I was wondering where your confidence as an actor originated from. Was it because you've been acting since at, at a young age, or, or did that happen overnight, your confidence in front of the camera? I actually, I used to be a shy little kid who didn't want to talk to people. I honestly have no idea when it changed. It's really weird i i should not be this outgoing <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of your charm josh it's part of your charm so now it's 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 a fun thing to be but it gets me into trouble a lot in the classroom uh-oh uh-oh are you back in school now 
I am. I uh, am. Oh, that that didn't sound like a happy I am. But well, you, but, I mean, school. Yeah, I know. I know. Summer's always more fun. Well, of course. Or when you're on a movie set, that's more fun. You know, definitely. That is that is more fun. Well, now you mentioned, you know, Barry's fashion and your fashion and all. And I know you love La Miniatura. What are you wearing today? Uh, right now, I am wearing the exact same clothes that I slept in. So I am <laughs> wearing my plaid pajamas. You are a man after my own heart. Let me tell you. I got. I got to. I got to tell you. Steph. I. I haven't gotten out of the house in the last three days. I love long weekends. <laughs> Aren't they great? I stayed it's, in the. It's the uh, best. I stayed in the house too, writing writing articles about some fashionable, fun kid who wants to be James Bond. I. I, I, I don't know, but that's what I was doing this weekend. There's nothing like just staying at home and having a little homebody day for yourself, you know? It's, it's, it's important. you got to have your rest days. That's, well, true. So what projects, you know, after this whole, the hub of, of Breakpoint, you know, the big release this weekend and hitting theaters and all, what's next on your plate as an actor? Well, next up is my uh, brand new Disney Junior TV show called The Lion Guard. I was really excited to tell you about it last time, but I couldn't tell you about it yet. I know. Um, but I can tell you about it now. Tell me. It's really exciting. It is, it's like The Lion King meets The Avengers. It's Simba's son, Kion, and he goes and gathers up this ragtag group of friends who go and protect the Pride Lands from hyenas and animals who want to eat other animals and scary things like that and they go and they protect the pride lands and they protect this uh the circle of life and it's it's really exciting and we have a tv movie coming out in november and then we have a series that starts in january and And it's called the lion guard it's going to be amazing and what character will you be i play bunga who is He's similar to my character on uh, The Adventures of Puss in Boots, if you're familiar with that. I am. He's, he's foolish. He's a, he's a little stupid. He's not the sharpest knife on the block. Uh, but he's he, he kind of just likes to jump into things before they're really thought through. But I think that makes that's part of what makes him such a brave, excited individual. His stupidity allows him to become a very functional member of the team. And uh, it's the Pride Lands, uh, the, um, the Lion Guard is a group of the Pride Lands keenest to sight and the bravest and the fiercest and the fastest. And uh, I play B- uh, Bunga, and Bunga's the bravest because of his stupidity. Joshua, from your perspective, what's the key to successful voice acting? Oh, you know, I really, I started in theatrical acting, and so I have a tendency to move around a lot behind the mic. Like, I I, I work with these really great voice actors, uh, Eric Bauza, Gray Griffin, Candy Mile, um, and they all really don't move a ton in front of the mic, and I do. So I'm not really the person to ask because I'm not a really conventional voice actor. The way I did it was I really just kind of moved a lot of my things that I did in theatrical acting and just did them while attempting my best to keep my head centered around the mic. You know, you, your process sounds more like what Sir Ben Kingsley does for voicing. Oh. Greg, do you remember for um, the, la- the Box Trolls, he talked about voicing the one character, and in order to get the voice right, he would actually lay on the floor. Oh. And and do strange things to get the right voice, and it sounds like you you like to do something like that too to get the the right feel for a voice. I don't do that much, but <laughs> I um I uh the Lion Guard usually records in a great studio in Burbank called Out Loud Audio, and they have one room that I always love it when we get it, uh because there's a ton of space. And they have wireless headphones. And so I like to go and put on the wireless headphones. And if Bunga is doing some sort of running thing where he runs up and then says something as a team, 
I will literally run from the back end of that room straight forward and then deliver my line. Because I don't, I don't have that sort of voice thing that other voice actors have that lets them, like, make it sound like they're doing that sort of stuff. I have to do it. And I do it, and I think that's part of what makes my sounds more unique. But you you dig deep and you really get involved in all of your characters, be it in yeah. be it live action or doing voicing. Do you like do you really like digging in deep to your characters? I do. I, I really do. I um after parental guidance, uh, where I had a stutter for about two or three months. I I was a really I was more shy than usual. I get so into my characters that I have to sometimes really work hard to get out of the characters. Wow. Wow. Now I have to ask you this. I know the answer to this, but I need people to hear your voice when you talk about this. What is your dream role to play? Uh, I know you know this because you've asked me this before. I want to be James Bond because he is the coolest of the cool. He's got the cool cars, which I love. I was able to actually name types of cars just on site at age two. Um, <laughs> so I love cars. Uh, that's a given with me. And I, he, he has cool suits. I love cool suits. Um <laughs> I, I wear La Natura and their clothing's amazing, and they have cool suits, and he he's cool, he's really suave, and I am not, and I want to be that. <laughs> well, speaking of suave and cool in James Bond, did you see they released the poster with the picture of the new Aston Martin on it? Yes, I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sorry to any listeners there with um, sensitive radios oh, or ears. That, we, but, have, we have to know what your first car is going to be once you get your license. Then. Oh, that, that, hey. Well, you know, my parents want to get me, want to, want my dad to sell his uh, uh, Audi Q5 and get me a Ford Fusion, but I don't really want a Ford Fusion <laughs> because I, I want something, you know, like, I want a Porsche. I want a Porsche 911 because those cars and cool and they're also really compact, which is easy for parking in a school parking lot. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you want to take a Porsche 911 to school? Yes. Oh, my heavens. Oh, my heavens. Would you be okay with all that attention you're going to get from a lot of people with the Porsche 911 at school? Are you, are you cool with that? The guys will want to do donuts. And the girls will want to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, it, there's, yeah. not, there's not too many downsides. <laughs> you know, Josh, the girls are going to want to be with you anyway because of the cool clothes that you wear and how cool you look. Aw, thank you. Which, by the there's way, I saw the pictures from the special screening of Breakpoint and that plaid <laughs> suit you had. That, that was definitely my number one outfit of all time. That I, with the vest I really, and the jacket. And I the, went, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, the whole the whole th ensemble just that was, blew me away. the uh, The story of actually how I got that outfit is really funny because I I literally I I went to La Miniatura's headquarters in downtown LA, and I I told them I want to look as outrageous as I possibly can. <laughs> can you do that? And they looked at me and told me, have we ever led you wrong? <laughs> then I went home with the greatest outfit that I have ever worn in the history of my life. I have to tell you, I think that is one of the coolest red carpet outfits I have ever seen. It's, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I, I owe it all to La Miniatura because they're awesome. And, and, of course, the great plaid design almost kind of looks like a tennis net or, Ooh, or a racket. I didn't think of that. Okay, now you can tell people that's why you have why it was plaid, because it looked like a tennis I, racket. I think I'm going to steal that. I think I'm going to steal that from you. You may. You have my permission, my friend. Awesome. Well, Perfect. Josh, I can't thank you enough for calling today. This has been, this has been the highlight of oh. my week, <laughs> let me tell you. You are, oh. you are always a joy. 
Thank you. You're so much fun to interview with. Oh, I'm glad. Now, make sure tell your dad I said hi. All right, I will. And you'll come back on the show again when, when we get closer to the Lion Guard? Absolutely. See you in November. Yes, you will. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And that was the fabulous Joshua Rush. Very quickly, I'm learning a lot from Joshua. I'm right now watching a video of two dudes eating donuts, doing donuts in a Porsche 911. They're doing donuts in a parking lot. Okay. They're spinning the Porsche and they're eating donuts. Tweet that. Tweet yeah. that to him. You can tweet to Joshua okay. at, yeah. at Joshua Rush. Okay. I'll send it to him. Yeah. So he will. Lo- Josh will love that. Double donuts with a Porsche. Oh, on, my so. God. As everybody can tell, Joshua is one of my favorite people. He's great. Great interview. He's one of my favorite. More importantly, he's a very talented actor as well. So He's fabulous. And yeah. speaking of talent. Right now, we have the very talented writer-director, Khalil Sullins, on the line. Hey, Khalil. Hi, Danny. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Welcome to Behind the Lens. My cinematic cohort, Greg Srizavazdi, is here as well. Hi, Greg. Hi. And he has had the joy of seeing Listening. I've only seen it four times now. He's seen it once. (laughs) Four times. (laughs) Wow. Well, that's great. Yeah. This is an well, an amazing, and the more times I see it, the more things I see in the film. Um, mm-hmm. I even went and I and I dug all my notes out from last year when I saw it at the fest level when Annie was was handling it. Mm-hmm. And the, I mean, the biggest thing that jumped out at me still jumps out at me: your Flickr three D stereoscopics that you use in there. You the the whole thematic and design of your story deals with neuromechanics technology and then we all you implement it in your visuals as well it is one of the most perfect melds of mind and and matter that i've seen on on film well thanks thank you uh yeah we put like a a lot of effort uh in pre-production into uh designing the look of the film and uh yeah the flicker 3d stuff you see um you know, the movie's hard sci-fi. It's, like, uh, meant to be believable, and all the science and technology is based on, like, real stuff. So for the Inside the Mind sequences, we didn't want to get into fantasy imagery. You know, once you start imagining what thoughts look like and showing rainbows and unicorns or, (laughs) you know, dragons with lasers on their heads or whatever people think about, you know, or what I think about maybe, I don't know, uh, uh, you start, yeah, it changes the tone of the movie and turns into a fantasy, but we really wanted to keep this believable tone, uh, but still enter this mind space. And so with this sort of flicker 3D stereoscopic uh, look, uh, it allowed us to, yeah, basically create this different feel so that we feel like we're entering a different world, uh, but still not sacrifice that hard sci-fi tone. Well, now, where does a story like listening come from? You're, t- you're dealing with metacognition, uh, insertion of nanotubes into spinal cords, um, thought decoding, you know, mental telepathy, and all of the EEG and brain-computer interfaces, all of which, it, as you said, is happening now. But this isn't exactly something you think that even uh, that a screenwriter would sit down at the breakfast table and say, I think I'm going to write a script about this today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, a lot of people ask me where does the idea come from? Or, that's an interesting question in general. Where do ideas come from? And, uh, yeah, for me, it's not as romantic as it might sound, I guess. Uh, but, like, before I write a script, I just sit down for a few weeks at the computer for, you know, eight hours a day, however long, and just write as many ideas as I can possibly come up with. Uh, and after I have, you know, 50 or 100 sort of basic concepts for movie ideas, then sort of try to pick the best of the best from those, you know. Sometimes your first quote-unquote great idea for a movie is your best one, but oftentimes it's something that sort of brews in your brain and comes out a bit later. Uh, And so, yeah, for listening, the initial seed of an idea was just what if someone invented telepathy. Uh, and I grew up reading comic books. I'm still a huge comic book fan. And uh, so I kind of like the idea of taking this superpower, you know, that you might see with Charles Xavier or something like that, and then making it real and believable in the world today. Uh, 
And so, yeah, then I did some research into how someone might actually go about inventing telepathy uh, today in the real world. Uh, and then also, I mean, for me, the best movies, the best sci-fi movies especially, you know, they're fun and entertaining and thrilling and all that, but they also can serve as an allegory, you know, and say mm-hmm. something about the world around us. So I sort of wanted to get into what the implications would be of inventing telepathy, this new advancement in communication technology on a personal level, you know, with David, the main character, and his wife and his best friend, but then also on a societal and governmental level and even global level, you know, as to what it would mean if we sort of opened up our thoughts to, uh, yeah, being read and influenced potentially. You know, even though the film's about mental telepathy and it, it talks a little bit about social media and extracting information and learning as much as we can from each other. Can you just talk about also the uh, part of your narrative which details the protagonist's journey to Cambodia where he finally gets to really listen in on what he wants from his own journey? Can you talk about how important it was for you to travel to Cambodia and fill out Yeah, that? totally. Yeah, we actually we just showed at the Cambodia Town Film Festival uh, this weekend. It was such a special screening for us because wow. Yeah, we met so many amazing people over there in Cambodia. Yeah, about, about you know, eight or ten minutes of the film takes place uh, in the jungle where the main character sort of, you know, escapes and, uh, and uh, meets this monk in this, uh, you know, temple that feels sort of older than time and you learn some meditation techniques. And, uh, yeah, one of the parts that was interesting for me, you know, is... Uh, uh, in a world where, you know, telepathy exists, you're, you're plugging into someone's brain and getting thoughts unfiltered, you know? We all have sort of a filter in our brain. We don't do and say everything we think, you know? You think before you speak. You think before you act. And that's a good thing, you know? That filter is a good thing, you know? But uh, in a world where telepathy exists, that filter is gone. And that's not too different, like you're saying, from the world of social media, you know, from you could go to any YouTube video online or a news article or whatever, and you just read all the comment threads underneath, and you get a whole lot of unfiltered thoughts. You know, mm-hmm. people get behind their technology and feel like, oh, I can just spit out whatever the first thing is that comes to my brain. And oftentimes, there's a lot of negativity in that. And uh, for me, yeah, telling a story about telepathy allowed us, in a very real way, you know tell a story where thought is reality you know when you're plugging in someone's brain you're experiencing their thoughts as though they're real you know whether what they're thinking about happens or doesn't happen or you know suddenly thinking about cheating on your wife is just as bad as actually cheating on your wife if you know she's plugging into your brain and experiencing those thoughts uh so yeah david goes to cambodia and uh we never say Cambodia explicitly in story, but he escapes to the other side of the planet after the government gets a hold of this technology and uh, and uh, decides to sort of try to learn some ways to be more mindful of his thoughts and control his thoughts in a certain way. And that was really interesting to me because, you know, I think that's some place that we don't always think about where we have control in terms of our relationships with other people and, you know, in our lives in general. We may not have control over what happens to us or, you know, even how we react in any given moment. But over time, the habits we build in our mind space, you know, what we think about, what we habitually think about, that will translate and manifest itself into, you know, reality in the world around us. Oh, yeah. Now, while you're, when you're writing a script like this, are you thinking, were you thinking of the visuals going hand in hand? Were you already seeing the images that would correlate to the storyline? Um, yeah, I mean, inevitably, I try, when I'm writing, I try to write, you know, in the most visual way possible, sort of only putting on the page what you'll actually see on the screen. Um, but when I was first writing the script, I was actually writing it with the intention of selling the script, uh, which is part of why it doesn't play like other micro-budget indie films, you know, mm-hmm. we have over 35 locations around the globe and sort of, you know, it's not one of these everything takes place in one house type movies. <laughs> uh, and that's because, yeah, I was I was trying to write a low-budget movie, but I was trying, my thought first was to try to sell it, and it got good response from the industry, you know, I don't know, 80 or 90, so basically the whole town requested to read it and turned into some meetings with some producers, and uh, but I didn't feel like anyone quite got it the way I wanted to, you know, do this film. And so I guess, yeah, the visuals were in my head. I did have a clear idea of how I wanted to make the movie. So, yeah, we decided to make it ourselves. And uh, 
And yeah, the first part of pre-production, we were in pre-production for about a year, but the first couple months of that was really just me gathering all my thoughts and putting together this director's book, we called it, you know, and it's a few hundred pages of just visual research of basically every creative decision. So yeah, all the cinematography styles you see in the film, uh, you know, every costume, every prop, you know, ideas about locations and sets. Kind of, you have to, when you're making a movie, when you're on set, you don't have time to be making creative decisions necessarily. Like, you have to make those creative decisions in advance, and then on set, it's about executing those and problem solving when a location doesn't quite match what you imagined in your head. Uh, so, yeah, I sort of put all that together in advance and uh, use that then as a springboard to give to each of the heads of departments for, uh, you know, them to then make their creative contributions. And, uh, yeah. yeah. The score, the score and the sound design to me was also very mesmerizing, yeah. yet also extremely subtle. Um, can you talk about developing that with the composer? And was that an overnight process, or was it, like you said, was it very intense as far as that collaboration goes? Um, yeah, our composer came on pretty early on. Uh, yeah, and like I was saying, you know, with this, I really wanted to use every tool at my disposal to tell the story, you know? So it's like I sort of approached every department, like how how do I tell the story with props? How do I tell the story with costume? How do I tell the story with music? How do I tell the story with color? How do I tell the story with sound design, especially a movie called listening, right? Like the (laughs) sound design and music would be so important. Um, And so, yeah, something, uh, so we had an incredible composer, Edward White. He's based in London. He was so amazing. And he came on, uh, I guess sort of right after we started editing and uh, we sort of got a rough cut going. Uh, Howard Hurd was our great editor and, uh, and Ed actually wrote a lot of music for the film, a lot of music for the film that isn't even in the final movie. Cause he would sort of write, we would send him a rough cut. He would write music. We would cut it into the film and uh, then we would recut to that music and sort of had this great back and forth that I think really helped develop the pace that you see in the final film because he would send us music and we'd be like, Oh yeah, we can actually cut this a lot faster. Even, you know, we can move this along much quicker. And uh, especially when you feel the emotion from the music as well. Uh, and yeah, so we recorded a, at, the, at the end of the day, we recorded a live orchestra in London, 17 piece orchestra with world-class musicians, you know, the same musicians that play on Hans Zimmer scores for, you know, 007 movies and Batman films, just really amazing musicians. And, uh, and Ed combined that with more electronic uh, sounding things and some digital synthesis and really trying to dirty up the music in some ways, I guess, because the movie's about communication, but it's about what gets in the way of communication. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so with sound design, it's the same thing. We sort of talked a lot about adding noise and different kinds of noises and not just you know, making things clear, but trying to put as much interference in there as possible because the movie is really about what gets in the way of people, uh, you know, communicating with each other. Now, you briefly mentioned it, and it's something uh, that really stands out for me visually, uh, along with the Flickr 3D, is your use of color. What The palettes mm-hmm. that you and, Bla- and your uh, cinematographer, Blake McClure, came up with are just stunning with your distinctive palettes and washes of greens, violets, yellows, you know, reds, especially that red room. How mm-hmm. did you go about choosing the colors for, of the color wheel to, uh, to represent uh, as an analogy and metaphor for the different uh, aspects of the film? Yeah, totally. And I mean, I come from a visual arts background, you know, I'm a painter and a sculptor sort of originally. So yeah, color is really interesting to me, but also in, in sci-fi films, especially, you know, if you think back to a lot of your favorite sci-fi films, they probably play with color in an interesting way. And that's because I think, you know, when you play with extremes of color, it can help transport the audience to sort of this alternate reality or this different world you're trying to create. Uh, and so, yeah, for us visually, we tried to tell the story from David's point of view, the main character, David, he's a computer programmer. And so we thought of him as someone who compartmentalizes his life. And so we created these five visual worlds, we called them. And each one had a unique color scheme and a unique method of camera movement. So, yeah, with David in his garage, everything's this vibrant green. And the camera's handheld and kinetic and uh, very energetic. And this is where David's most in his element and inventing and alive. But it also looks like a horror film a little bit because it's really Mm -hmm. dangerous what they're doing. 
but yeah, that, that contrasts to like his home world where the camera never moves and it's these lifeless violets and silhouettes and uh, that reflects, you know, his broken marriage and this relationship with his wife and his daughter. And yeah, throughout the film and the outside world are these bright yellows and sort of paranoid camera movement and lens flares. And we wanted David to feel very uncomfortable in the outside world and CIA world's this dark play on the American flag with a dark red, white, and blue color scheme mm. and robotic camera movements sort of with the camera movements also it's like the technology progresses throughout the film. The filmmaking style becomes a bit more slick too, and that's mm. very intentional, you know. So at the beginning in the garage everything's handheld and in the end, you know, in the government labs everything's robotic and on dollies and smooth fluid camera movements. Uh yeah, so we did sort of try to play with, uh, yeah, color and, you know, all these things. Yeah, just trying to use every tool at your disposal to really uh, enhance the story. Regarding using every tool of your, uh, at your disposal, with your debut film, it kind of reminded me as a film fan of kind of, I know this is kind of <laughs> uh, bringing up some big names, but like the, the debuts of guys like uh, George Lucas, uh, Nolan, Nicholas Rowe, Carruth. Were these are these kind of visualists who use every department at you know at their beck and call and collaborate as well? Are are these filmmakers that you uh, that influenced your own work as well as a as a storyteller? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we I definitely you know looked at other filmmakers' first films and uh, yeah you know uh, yeah Primer I love Cruz Primer that's an amazing movie I sort of tried to take that and go a bit more global with it. Uh, yeah. yeah, THX 1138 Lucas yeah it's amazing. Uh, yeah, Scorsese's early films, uh, Pi, Darren Aronofsky's first film, uh, yeah, and following with Nolan. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, there are so many great films. And, uh, yeah, and then in the sci-fi realm, you know, a little more Gattaca, I love that film. Uh, so, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, those are all filmmakers I love. And, uh, you know, I think we're all influenced by filmmakers and things and the whole world around us, you know, it's kind of like originality, where does that come from? And yeah. I think it's where we all have all of our multiple influences and they filter through us and then come out in some other unique way. Uh, but yeah, I definitely love all those filmmakers and films. Well, so, so much of this film falls to your, to your principles, primarily your three key actors, Tom Stroppel, mm -hmm. RDR, and Amber, Bol uh, Amber Bollinger. Mm -hmm. Where did you find them? They're previously undiscovered talents. And I've got to say, Thomas and Artie in, in particular just blow you away with their performances yeah they were fantastic yeah we had such a great time making the movie with them and they're yeah not only great actors but great people too and just really fun to be around and uh uh yeah we did we did all the casting ourselves actually and yeah early on when we were doing casting you know it's it's a low budget movie it's a lot lower budget than most people might imagine and you know so we didn't quite have the money to go union everything and everything else and the, or even have, you know, casting we were doing ourselves for a few months in pre-production, auditioning literally thousands of actors for all these roles. And uh, some people said we were crazy. You know, they said, oh, if actors haven't made it by the time they're 30, you know, they aren't really any good to begin with. And uh, and I sort of took that personally. So I'm like, I'm, I'm 30 and, you know, I haven't been discovered, quote unquote, or whatever. So, if, you know, if I believe in myself, I'm going to go believe, you know, I believe I can find other talented people out there, too. And, uh, and yeah, and Thomas and Amber and Artie, you know, they all, from the very beginning, from their first auditions, they really embodied the roles and we sort of knew, yeah, they're them. Uh, and we did a lot of chemistry reads as well, sort of mixing different actors together to see, you know, not just how they perform in the role, but how they react to each other and bounce off each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, hopefully this movie does well for all of us, you know, and uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, I can turn them into some future stars as well. Now, did they all know, did the, did the gentlemen know coming in, they were, it would require shaving heads? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... Uh, Let's see. I don't know if <laughs> maybe some of them knew because I guess one of the scenes we had them reading for, like, sort of said, you know, like, yeah, they have an EEG net on and their heads bald. Yeah, so RDR, when he came in, uh, who plays Ryan, he had a full head of hair, beautiful hair down to his shoulders. You know, he had this whole surf, surfer vibe coming in. <laughs> And we're like, yeah, you know, you sort of need to shave your head for the role. And he was, he was totally down for it, you know. And the girls, too, Amber and Christine, they both had to shave these big patches of head on the side. Uh, 
patches of hair on the side of their head. And, you know, now it's actually fashionable. You know, when yeah. we were filming, this was back in 2012, I guess. You know, it was just starting to become fashionable. But, uh, yeah, Amber actually kept the hairstyle for like a year and a half after we finished filming because, yeah, it's sort of a look now. Just in general, what has it been like showing your film to all over the world and your journey I guess, post-production and, and seeing the reception to your film. I'm sure that must be a... I know it's hard to encapsulate, but what has that journey been like for you? Yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been just fantastic. And not just for me, but for everyone, I think, who's worked on this film. I'm so proud of everyone's uh, contributions. And uh, we had such a talented team. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we, we did, we had, we've been at over 30 film festivals now. Our world premiere was at Woodstock Film Festival almost a year ago now. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and that was that for that first world premiere was when I was sort of the most anxious, I guess, you know, uh, cause you, you do all this work, you know, and you're basically trying to engineer emotions in a way, you know, you're adding together all these ingredients, all these tools that you have at your disposal to try to engineer, you know, suspense or a shriek or a laugh or whatever it might be. And you don't know, does it all add up to those things? You don't know until you watch it with an audience. And, uh, yeah, the reaction of Woodstock was just so amazing, and the audience really loved it. And, and some things I didn't expect, too, because I'm so inside of it, you know? Like, so the needle injection scenes, for instance, you know, they do these spinal injections. And they're intense scenes, but, you know, I know they're all fake needles and everything else, but being in, you know, the back row of the audience and just seeing the whole audience sort of shrink down in their seats <laughs> and, like, shudder at the thought of a needle going into their spine like that, uh, yeah, it was really satisfying, I guess. So. And I'm sure for the second time when they see Amber <laughs> ripping off her shirt and rushing to volunteer to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was fun, too. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, and when you watch it multiple times, there's, some, there's a fun reaction from David, too, when she takes off her shirt and he's all sort of uncomfortable around it. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and some people have needle phobias. You know, I guess I don't have a needle phobia, but, yeah, there are people who just can't watch those scenes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, the whole thing has been so amazing and traveling around with the film and getting also getting to travel to all these cities you might not go to otherwise. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the last time we talked, I was actually in Anchorage, Alaska at the time. And, mm-hmm. you know, everyone was so nice and so great, you know, spending a little bit of time in Anchorage and, you know, been to St. Louis and Cleveland and, you know, a couple cities in Florida and Dubuque, Iowa, and, you know, just all these places that, you know, all these great towns around the country. It's been sort of a great way to... Uh, yeah, see the country and, you know, also got an excuse to go to Hawaii for a little while and nice. yeah, our international premiere in London. That was amazing. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's really just been so much fun this past year. So now what's next? Now that listening is out there and it hits theaters this Friday. Yeah. So yeah, uh, this Friday, September 11th, it comes out in uh, about a dozen cities uh, in the U.S. and Canada, and uh, on all video on demand platforms, every major cable company, iTunes, Amazon, you know, Google Play, however you watch movies, it'll be available this even, Friday. Even, even, uh, even Time Warner? Yeah, Time Warner will oh be on Time God. Warner. Yeah, we, we've been, the reaction to the film has been really great. So everyone's picked us up. Yeah, all the major cable companies picked us up, which, which doesn't happen with all indie films. So we've been really lucky, and hopefully it bodes well for the release of the film. Uh, um, and yeah, so, uh, we'll be traveling around doing some Q and A's, uh, yeah, in LA, we have a couple screenings, uh, one in Pasadena on Friday night, one in Hollywood on Saturday night, and we're doing Q and A's with the cast and crew, and we're going to do a Q and A in San Diego on Tuesday, and a Q and A in Vancouver on the 20th, a Q and A in North Carolina, I think, on the 25th, uh, so yeah, we're going to tour around a little bit doing Q and A's with audiences, uh. And, uh, yeah, in the meantime, I'm writing. Uh, most of my time right now is spent writing the next script. Uh, I'm working on a detective thriller that I'm really excited about. Ooh. Nice. So, now that, <laughs> so now that you have survived this first process of beginning to end of listening, what have you learned about yourself as a filmmaker? You know, I knew I always loved writing, I shouldn't say I knew I always did. I guess when I went to film school, I wanted to be a director. And uh, and then in film school, I sort of saw, I went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, which was a fantastic film school. Uh, Well, I'm sorry, it sort of has a reputation for these fantastic movies and, you know, commercials and stuff that look great. Uh, 
but don't always have the most substance, you know. So I saw these student films, and I felt like they looked and sounded amazing, but some of them were failing on the script level. And uh, so I really started to focus on screenwriting, you know, and just learning the storytelling craft uh, as much as I could in film school and really fell in love with the writing process. So for me, writing is sort of the most creative part of the process. That's when you're generating something from nothing. Uh, and after I graduated, I wrote seven or eight scripts before I had listening, felt like it was worth, you know, investing all of this energy into to actually make the film. But directing was going to be sort of an experiment. You know, I, had, mm -hmm. I didn't shoot any short films or commercials or music videos. I really hadn't directed anything. You know, this was, I had spent time writing, but listening to this feature film was the first time I was really ever on set directing my own project. So it was a bit of an experiment. And I didn't know how it was going to be, but honestly, I mean, it, it's sort of weird to say, but it was just such an incredible experience. It really felt like discovering what I was put on this planet to do in a weird way, you know, felt like, okay, these are all my talents, everything that I've ever learned, I'm really able to put it to some good use, hopefully directing. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm planning to keep on making movies for as long as I can. And uh, yeah, just keep at it. Well, I'm damn happy to hear you say that. <laughs> because Thank I you. mean I love this film I love what you bring to the table you make us think you make us think and you create you lay a foundation for great discussion after long after the film ends and uh, I think creating discussion about a film I think is, is very key and very important and I mean just job well done Cleo I can't wait for the detective thriller <laughs> No, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, and yeah, yeah, hopefully it does start a discussion, you know, about technology. You know, some people see the film, they think I'm anti-technology, and that can be further from the truth. You know, I'm a techno geek and, you know, early adopter of every latest iPhone and gadget and whatnot. And yeah, the message of the film isn't that we all need to go, you know, unplug or blow up the internet or something like that. You know, we don't condone David's actions at the end of the film, it ends, you know, sort of tragically. And that's not that we're saying, no, oh, everyone should go out and do this. Like, uh, it's more to start a conversation so that hopefully, yeah, we can be mindful about how we're using social media and Twitter and Instagram and everything, you know, this, this digital reality we're creating around ourselves and this environment we're creating just by, you know, every tweet you send out. Is it something positive or are you bashing on someone, you know, like... Uh, yeah, hopefully we can sort of think about these things a little bit more. Well, Khalil, we are out of time today. I can't thank you enough for thank joining you. us, and I hope you will come back again. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Terrific. Thanks, Khalil. Thank you. Thanks so Bye -bye. much. And yes, we got our music cue. That's I it. mean, we we are like almost we got like twenty seconds left here. So in our twenty seconds, I'm going to mention two two new books from my library. I just got. The new Preston Sturgis book, Preston Sturgis on Preston Sturgis, nice. and a very interesting book, The Real Middle Ages, R-E-E-L, Middle Ages, all the films that were done about the Middle Ages and capsule reviews oh, nice. and tidbits and information about them. Cool. So, and of course, TCM, don't TCM. forget about it. It is now Let's Movie. Let's Movie. That's the new, mo that's the nice. new logo. And since... We're at the 12 o'clock mark. That's it. We will see you next week. Diamond Dallas Page next week <laughs> here on Behind the Lens.